Um, just to do a couple of quick introductions, um, me very briefly and a bit more on mic. Um, my name's Tom Brooks. Uh, thanks, Chris, for that intro. I work for the European Climate Foundation, um, which is one of the largest funders of climate policy work uh, in, in Europe, in the EU. And I run advocacy and communications um, for the European Climate Foundation. And I've been doing this for about three years, which is the, <clears throat> the length of my time, essentially, in, in the climate world. Um, I was at Copenhagen, <coughs> at the Copenhagen Summit for, for Climate Gate. Um, and one of our responses to that was to help start up a project which is now running in the UK called the carbonbrief.org, which looks at correcting, essentially, misreporting and inaccurate reporting of climate science. Um, we watched the IPCC reviews post-climate gate very carefully, worked with a lot of climate scientists around the world um, on trying to correct some of the many <coughs> crimes d done against the discipline. Now, I've spent three years in this field, as I said. You don't have to spend more than about 10 minutes in this field to learn the name of the man that I'm very proud to introduce. Um, now, Mike Mann is one of the world's leading climate scientists. He's received many honors, including NOAA's Outstanding Publication Award in 2002, selection by Scientific American as one of the 50 leading visionaries in science and technology in, in, also in 2002. He shared the Nobel Peace Prize with the other IPCC authors and indeed Al Gore in 2007. And in 2012, he was inducted as a fellow of the American Geophysical Union and was awarded the Hans Uschke Medal of the European Geosciences Union. So worldwide recognition of Mike's work. And Mike and his work have also become a focus of what may well be the most intense and sustained attack on science by corporate and political interests in the, in the grim history of denialism, which obviously dates back beyond climate science, but has probably intensified through onto climate science in these past several decades. In the words of his fellow, ben, fellow scientist Ben Santo, which is quoted in the book, there are people who believe that if they can bring down Mike Mann, they can bring down the IPCC. Well, I'm very glad to say they haven't brought him down yet. And it is my great honor and privilege to open South by Southwest Eco by introducing to you Professor Mike Mann. Thanks very much for making the time for this, Mike. Thank you. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about kind of where this starts. You say in the book that you were drawn to the big picture questions in, in science, and clearly you don't get much bigger picture than the future of the planet's ability to sustain humanity. But talk to us a little about how you got into this field, where you started. Sure. I started out as, um, you know, I, I was a science and math geek, a nerd. Um, I, uh, you know, my idea of a, a good time uh, in high school was hanging out with my uh, computer programming friends on a Saturday night eating pizza and, and writing computer programs to solve problems. And so I've always loved problem solving, uh, computational approaches to solving uh, problems in science. Um, uh, as a, an undergraduate at UC Berkeley, I ended up majoring, double majoring in uh, applied math and physics. Uh, I went on to uh, study theoretical physics and I figured that's what I was going to spend the rest of my career uh, doing. Um, and then midway uh, through uh, my PhD, I sort of realized that my heart wasn't quite in uh, what I was working on. Uh, it was a sort of a tough time in physics. Uh, they had cut funding for uh, the superconducting super collider. This was the late 1980s. In fact, it was going to be based here in Texas. Um, and there were a lot of politics behind that. It ended up getting cut. And it turns out that you know, suddenly physicists didn't have nearly the levels of funding uh, that they used to. Um, you know, and you were getting funneled into sort of increasingly applied areas of, of, uh, of physics if you wanted to, to work, especially on, on theory. Um, it wasn't the big picture stuff that I had in mind when I had first uh, gotten interested in going into that field. And I literally opened up uh, the, the catalog at Yale University, the catalog of applied science, to see what else was going on, what other sorts of research projects were you know, were underway um, at the university where you could use physics and math to solve, you know, big picture problems. And I saw that there was a guy um, in the Department of Geology and Geophysics, Barry Saltzman, who was working on mathematical modeling of Earth's climate system. And it sounded really interesting to me. I went to talk with him, um, and one thing led to another. I ended up doing my PhD with him on climate. That is where it begins, and in fact, um, you know, I never imagined that when I you know, decided to major in applied math and physics and 
go on to a career in theoretical physics and then to climate science, I would somehow find myself right. <laughs> at the center of this raging societal debate sure. over climate change. It wasn't what I set out to do. No, sure. No, I can imagine. I can imagine. Um, you wouldn't wish it on your worst enemy at the end of the day. Um, but so let's just, just look forward a bit and, and, and to the first um, instance, or well, kind of the second instance in a way, of, of the hockey stick, which is the, the paper MBH 99, um, released in 1999 that showed the warming in the late 20th century. That's this graph in, in terms of a millennial context um, for the first time. And the response to it was, was pretty immediate, um, as, as I understand. The kind of contrarian denialist attack started, started fairly, uh, fairly promptly. And you were a relatively young scientist, obviously, at, at, at the time. I mean, how, how did you respond to it at first? Were you immediately aware, aware of the scale of what was happening or the implications of what was happening? What did you feel about it at the time? Well, there was sort of a crescendo of, 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 of attacks um, and efforts to undermine you know, this, this um, work. And so uh, I suppose um, you know, over time, I increasingly recognized that, um, you know, that this work that we had published in the late 1990s had indeed become an icon in the climate change debate. In particular, when it was featured, this graph right here is actually from the summary for policymakers of the 2001 IPCC report. And so suddenly, climate change really was, um, was this uh, iconic uh, representation of the reality of what we were doing to the planet. And that immediately made it a focus of attack. And so it was really in 2001, with the release of the IPCC report and the featuring of this graph in that report, where the you know, attacks began, began to escalate. You know, so within a, a few years, I was you know, testifying in the Senate um, in uh, Senator James Inhofe's uh, um, uh, hearing that he had held. Uh, he was chairing the. Uh, Energy and Public Works um, uh, Committee. Uh, James Inhofe, of course, the senior senator from uh, the state to the north, the hottest state ever uh, as of last summer. Um, uh, but he's a climate change denier. He's yeah. declared that climate change is the single greatest hoax ever perpetrated on the American people. And somehow sea level and glaciers and ocean temperatures have played along with the hoax. Um, so I was, you know, subject to attack by political figures like James Inhofe. Then uh, a couple of years later, of course, Joe Barton uh, of right. Texas um, issued a civil subpoena, a yeah. subpoena demanding all of my emails and documents from my entire career, and it really, you know, continued yeah. uh, to escalate. And in those early days, when when this kind of stuff had, uh, had first started, I mean, obviously, political attacks on science aren't new as such. They they clearly haven't before, and indeed. There's People in this room have had a, a, a lot of experience of this past over other issues like smoking, for, sure. for example. But as a scientist at the core of that, did you feel at that time that it was your, your job as such, your role, to go out and defend your work in that very public way? How, how, or was that a new piece to what you were doing? Was that a new way of thinking about your work at the time? Yeah, I suppose as scientists, we're used to you know, good faith criticism. I mean, that's actually essential in right. science. You need true skepticism. You need that give and take. Um, it's the self-correcting machinery, as Carl Sagan yeah. uh, used to put it, that keeps science sort of uh, you know, moving towards a better understanding of the way the world works. And so as a scientist, you're used to that. Um, you know, my good friend um, uh, and uh, one, of, one of the great scientists, uh, climate scientists and, and communicators um, who sadly passed away a, a few years ago, Steve Schneider, um, wrote a book, you know, Science as a Contact Sport. And science is a contact sport. But as long as that, that tussle is in good faith, mm -hmm. then, you know, then things are working the way they're supposed to. It's when you begin to realize that the criticisms aren't in good faith. Um, you're, you know, the criticisms aren't of a particular choice that you might have made or the questions over the robustness of your result with respect to you know, uh, the data you use or the method you use, they start to be, the, the attacks question your integrity. Right. Um, they, uh, they are very personal and ad hominem. When you start to find yourself subject to those attacks, you suddenly realize you're, you're not in Kansas anymore. Right. This isn't the usual give and take of, of scientific discourse. It's something different. And as a scientist, it takes a while to realize that. And it sure. took me, 
you know, uh, some number of years to realize, okay, you know, I, I'm in a bigger, <laughs> this isn't about the science. It's right. a proxy war, <laughs> no pun intended, yeah. um, for, um, for the political battle over climate change. And once I realized that, um, I was able to sort of uh, view my role in this, um, not just as a scientist defending one's work, but as somebody who has an opportunity, you know, not just an opportunity, but a responsibility to use the, you know, use that as, as a means of actually trying to communicate yeah. knowledge and fight back against the, the disinformation right. effort. Right. And one of the interesting things about the way that this debate has panned out, um, and you mentioned obviously that the attacks really intensified at the point when the graph was published in the IPCC third assessment report. And I just wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about the IPCC itself, because it's often presented in this debate as this kind of huge monolithic organization which, which creates science and which it sort of holds the, <clears throat> holds the pen on the global opinion of science as such. Um, as I said, I've spent a bit of time watching the IPCC over these, over these past years, and that's certainly not the, the reality that, <laughs> that, that I've picked up. Um, but if you could just kind of expand a little bit on, on the role of the IPCC, and obviously you were, you were an author in the third sure. assessment report. Yeah, I mean, the IPCC is made up of, you know, hundreds um, of scientists like me who do this on a voluntary basis because we believe, you know, it's important to get the science right. It, it's important to make sure that uh, the public discourse is informed by an accurate and honest assessment of what the scientific evidence uh, has to offer. And so, you know, there's a role for science in informing policy. Um, and the IPCC seeks to do that. But it doesn't seek to prescribe policy, and it also doesn't have a research agenda. Its agenda is simply to assess uh, the peer-reviewed scientific literature. Um, that's why it's called an assessment. It's not doing new research. Um, and so, you know, hundreds of scientists like me uh, volunteer our time. Um, we're not paid for our involvement with the IPCC. Um, and we do our best to summarize the state of knowledge um, in various technical areas of the science. Uh, there are three different reports. Uh, working group one is on the basic fundamental science. Working group two is on the uh, projected impacts of climate change. And then working group three is on the issue of mitigation, solutions, what we can do to stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations. Um, so you know, hundreds of, of scientists devote their time uh, uh, you know, on a voluntary basis to, to working on these reports because we feel it's important. We feel it's sort of part of our, you know, our responsibility as scientists to, to make sure that the science is communicated accurately because we all know all too well that, it, you know, in the absence of such an effort, what will fill the vacuum is disinformation and distortions and highly politicized uh, efforts to distort the public discourse. And speaking of highly politicized efforts to, dis <laughs> to distort the public discourse, one of the um, uh, one of the tactics, if you will, that was that's been used quite widely in the climate war, um, and particularly in reference to to the hockey stick, is the kind of counter report, the the, the sudden um, uh, elucidation of an idea which undermines your approach in some way, or that undermines this graph in some way. And one of the most famous examples of that was the McIntyre McKittrick report on on the hockey stick, which actually has ended up hanging around. I mean, you still occasionally still see. Uh, uh, reference reference to it. Although, These myths obviously. never die. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so just talk a, a little bit about that, because obviously neither of those people is a climate scientist as such. And yet that was a report which a lot of scientists have spent a lot of time analyzing, taking apart, and responding to. Um, that, so that, that certainly sucked up a lot of resource. Just, just talk a little bit about how the community responded to that, and, and indeed how you think about <laughs> how the community ought to be responding to those kinds of challenges. It's a great question because it's, it's a tough choice we face, right? Where, um, you know, uh, science is, is often under attack uh, and the, uh, the sorts of attacks that aren't really scientific in nature, sometimes they're pseudo-scientific. They, they have sort of an air of scientific um, plausibility to them. Uh, they use the language of science. I mean, it's, not, it's something we see not just in climate change, we see it in, you know, the evolution, you know, intelligent design debate. Um, uh, increasingly sophisticated efforts to attack science uh, using you know, methods and arguments that seem plausible, that sound scientific, and it takes some work um, to actually refute them. Um, they're not just sort of the standard 
easily dismissed myths like the globe is cooling or the sun is the reason for all climate change. Um, they are often more sophisticated. Um, their effort isn't just to confuse the public, it's presumably to try to convince some of the scientific community that their criticisms are legitimate. And that means you have to take them seriously. You have to take these attacks seriously. At the same time, if we as scientists spend all of our time responding to one attack after another, um, then we're not moving the science forward. And so there is this um, difficult choice we face as to how much of our time and, and, and resources to put into refuting disinformation and uh, dishonest attacks, and how much of our, our time and, and resources to trying to answer the, the real questions. Uh, what's frustrating to me as a climate scientist is that in our political discourse uh, today, you know, we are actually uh, dealing with uh, a debate um, as to whether or not climate change even exists. Um, and our, our political system is divided uh, uh, on that issue, and the public is somewhat divided on that issue. Whereas when you look at what the science has to say, um, there is no scientific debate about whether we are warming the planet and changing the climate by increasing greenhouse gas concentrations. You know, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences is on record as stating that's the case. The National Academies of all the major industrial nations are on record. So it's, um, it's important. Uh, you know, there are real uh, questions that we could be talking about. We could be having a good faith debate, as I like to say, about the policies that we should be enacting to deal with this threat. But we can't have a good faith debate about whether or not the threat even exists. And sadly, we're sort of stuck in that debate to some extent here in the US in our yeah. politics. 